All financial support for this podcast comes from my patrons on patreon.com. If you'd like to join in with the patrons, please check out patreon.com slash Darwin Gross. That's D-A-R-W-I-N-G-R-O-S-S-E. Now enjoy the podcast. Okay, today I have the great pleasure of uh, talking to somebody. I, I've i bumped into her a number of times over the years. Most recently, it was at uh, Seth Kluett's Sounding Circuits uh, presentation at the New York Public Library, where she was uh, one of the performers. She did this really cool thing on the game track that was uh, uh, a real pleasant uh, introduction to some of the more... Uh, interesting music that can be done. I think it was a really great way to introduce that to people that were at the library. But in any case, I'm very excited to have a talk with Lainey Pfefferman. Lainey, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing great. How are you? All right. Why don't we start off by having you describe your work? Because um, from my perspective, you do so many things almost all simultaneously (laughs) (laughs) that it's yeah, it's really kind of hard for me to peg you down as, you know, as having one one particular body of work. So I, I would love for you to explain kind of your artistic work. Oof. Um, yeah, I have the same feeling that I when people ask me what I do, I get kind of uh, lost in my own head and like, oh, what do you really what do you want to hear from me? What what should I what should I tell you? What should I focus on? I mean, I. I default to saying I'm a composer because no matter what I'm doing, I'm still kind of like organizing sound experiences for some kind of audience. So in my mind, the way I grew up in my education, that's a composer. So I tell people I'm a composer, but that can look so different. You know, today I'm focusing on a piece that I'm making with a bunch of awesome collaborators. It's going to be an app and people will experience it through their phones as a community. And it's it's really kind of a um, a public sound art walking through an app kind of a piece. And there's that side of my life where I want to use technology to get people really engaged with sound and community. But then, you know, I write string quartets and choir pieces and stuff like that. I put black dots on lines and I, and I work with that tradition and that's, I don't know, I don't know percentages. That's a big chunk of my life too. I love doing that. Um, And more and more I'm integrating technology into that part of what I do. So I usually have, some kind of fixed media track behind whatever piece I'm making. So there's that side of what I do. And then I'm a teacher. You know, I teach at uh, Stevens Institute of Technology. It's like engineering school in Hoboken. And they have this cool music tech program. And I teach, you know, synthesis and electroacoustic composition and fun odds and ends. So there's that side. And then, gosh, I'm an organizer. So I do a lot of work putting together concerts, festivals, conferences, for the new music community that I really work in and care about. So a lot of my brain power goes into like spreadsheets and emails and schedules and <laughs> that kind of thing. So that's kind of maybe the big bins of what I do. Right. I think it's, uh, I think it's interesting to hear that your uh, sort of like your tools range from manuscript paper to spreadsheets. That's uh that's pretty <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. I would say it's some, um, like most projects are dipping into like weird tools for every project. Like, oh, okay, this is going to be, I'm writing for a string quartet, but you're going to get cues from the tape. So I'm going to put a waveform as like a track underneath the tape so you can see spikes and amplitude. Or like, <laughs> oh, this is a laptop ensemble piece, but I'm really interested kind of in group trauma and you're going to have to dig into what's making you most anxious and perform it in front of a crowd. Like everything's just a little off or a little extra demanding. Um right. So well, I'm very demanding on the people. Yeah, the other thing you didn't talk about, though, is that you actually perform a fair amount too, right? Yeah, I do. That's true. So, yeah, there's – right now I perform the most my solo um, – I have a voice and electronics project called White Fire, and it's really – it's only a few years old, and I'm still kind of – it's in the – it feels like it's in the larval stages, so I don't quite know what it's going to become. But the basic structure of it is I write songs for myself, and I use um, all different kinds of – little, uh, you know, scraps of audio from my life that I care about it. And I bring those in as tools and I make all of the sounds surrounding my voice out of almost exclusively out of recordings I've made around my house, around um, different travels that I've taken. And then I muck about with them in a computer to make them sound as cool as I can. And then I do crazy effects on my voice. Like I, lately my favorite technique is doing vocoding, but I'm singing not on top of like a steady signal, but I'm singing on top of recording, like a very 
dynamic recording of something. So like there's a bridge in Brooklyn that's really beautiful and resonant. So I sing where the signal that I'm imposing my voice on top of is, you know, the Gil Hodges Memorial Bridge. Oh, um, that's amazing. It's super cool. It's a really easy thing to do. I'm kind of, I'm trying to get all my students to do it and you just sound like a weird ghost from the future. It's the most <laughs> fun technique because your voice will go in and out as the signal goes in and out. Anyway, so it's weirdo songs like that where it, it's, I'm still trying to figure out where they live. They're, um, I mean, in an experimental music venue, like they're cool, but they're maybe a little, I don't know, poppy's the wrong word, but they're a little like, this is a four minute song. Here you go. But then they're kind of a little too weird and out there, I think, for a traditional, like, we're standing around drinking beer venue. I don't know. So I have right. to figure out. It's all larval. I don't know. I'm still figuring that one out, but I love it. And uh, so that's one performing side. And then another big performing side is um, I'm in this laptop ensemble called Sideband. And that's what you saw me perform. I had such a blast at Seth's fabulous exhibit at the library. Sideband did a little mini set just to show what kind of network computer music can look like these days. And um, I love those folks. And we... We perform kind of like a sort of a tour year at this point. We all live in different spots. Mm -hmm. We're kind of busy with other stuff, but I love playing with that group because we're all really different, you know, composers, performers, but we all kind of had this commitment to, we're all kind of in some way connected to Princeton. And when we were at Princeton, we all were really into the Princeton Laptop Orchestra. I'm actually in your honor. I'm wearing my Princeton Laptop Orchestra t-shirt oh, as yeah. we talk. It's very like, I don't know, club or team. It just feels like a real a real tight bunch of folks. So out of that grew this kind of pro touring ensemble where we could take laptop orchestra repertoire, but then dig into it, not as undergraduates, taking it as a class, but like as grad students, professors out in the world, caring about this rep the way a string quartet will learn their own rep and keep it in their arsenal. So that's, that's kind of another branch of my performing life that I love doing because we're all figuring it out together and, and it's just a lovely bunch of folks. Right. Now, in kind of reviewing uh, your body of work, one of the things that I noticed was that you are not really very conventional or very conservative about your use of instrumentation or tooling <laughs> no. at all. I mean, you will yeah. use I, – I get this sense that if you were in a room with a comb and a piece of paper, you'd be <laughs> like, I got it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you nailed it. That's what, I, that's what excites me. You know, I've written, God, I've written pieces for six kazoos. I've written pieces for, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the weirdest stuff that I could say, but like uh, choir, choir where everyone gets a rain stick and a noisemaker. Like, um, right. I, I love that. I don't know. It feels like a quick way to get fresh listening if you right. have fresh instrumentation. Yeah. I don't know. So even when I'm writing for more traditional ensembles, I love figuring out ways just to get a timbre or a, an unexpected tool in there where everyone will be like, whoa. Wait a minute. Whoa, what's that? How's that happening? Well, I think that puts people in a position to just be get away from maybe their ossified way of doing the thing that they've been doing for their whole life mm -hmm. and take a different approach at the at the musical nature that they got in them, right? Mm hmm really Yeah, it's funny. I think I think some composers really get their like their juice, their energy out of oh, I'm gonna craft the perfect, like I'm thinking microtonally and I will craft the perfect seven note phrase that will encapsulate the energy I want at this moment. And I'm not like that. I'm way more about slabs of sound and large scale kind of energy focus. So I do think that, yeah, that means exactly as you say, like getting people to get out of their comfort zone for, for tech, for ugh, sounds or techniques above like the micro decision making of right. note to note or chord to chord. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So true. Um, so one of the things I like doing in my podcast is talking to people about their background and how they got to be in, be the artists that they are. And I am curious, how do you, how do you become a lady of <laughs> How um, do you, how do you come to the point where you feel free to write string quartets or run around with a laptop orchestra or yeah. write a piece for six kazoos? Um, I'm curious. I mean, first of all, I would love to meet your parents. Uh, because I, <laughs> you know, you should um, be right yeah, because uh, it, it seems like you must have had your background must be one of a lot of acceptance and a mm -hmm. lot of experimentation. I'm curious what that looks like. Well, God, that is a really good point. I bet a lot of the freedom I feel to do stuff is just I got some family that loves me, and they, you know, 
yeah, accept, gosh, accept it. Even just, I grew up with support. I didn't grow up afraid that I would do something that would make my family lose respect for me or lose, um, gosh, love for me. I do think that's something, oh, when we talk about helping artists and we're going to help them at the college level or the high school level, that's great. But geez, just growing up as a little kid and feeling like I had a supportive family, I think melted into my brain in a way that lets me, yeah, not be afraid to write for six kazoos or for mm-hmm. asking people to be very, to be doing different things from what they normally do. Like that, that level of comfort with myself is probably a big deal. So yeah, I don't know. I had lovely parents. I actually grew up a classical pianist. So I was going to kind of be on that road to like, I'm going to play Hammer Clavier, the best ever. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and uh, I kind of fell off that train. I had a, a back condition. I had scoliosis and I had to be in a brace all day and I just wasn't comfortable playing piano anymore. And I was a big, you know, one of those like play piano all day kind of kids. And I just couldn't do that anymore. And that kind of slid me into new music. So I had a background in music. My brain was already toward music, but, um, but that kind of constraint, I'm so grateful for it. Cause now I look back like, Oh, I think I would have been horribly suited for a life in like 19th century rep doing solo piano. But I, but having that background meant that I had shops that let me into conversations already in high school. I had a great, theory composition teacher, Randall Bauer, Randy Bauer, who showed us a lot of 20th century music. And I had never heard a lot of this stuff before and I got really excited. And so that's the way that kind of happened. But then at the same time, you know, my dad's a mathematician and I loved math and I studied a ton of math. And that made me, I think, less fearful for the technical side that, you know, I saw friends get really like, oh God, using technology and music, oh no. And really, I think having had a pretty strong math background meant I wasn't as just default fearful of technology. It's like, ah, it's ones and zeros. Like, we'll figure it out. Something right. like if you want to make a cool sound, I didn't yeah. feel reverent of it. I think that's it. I didn't feel scared of this outside reverent thing called technology. I'd grown up around abstract math and, and applications of technology. So I was like, oh, it's a, it's a fun little like tool, whirly gig thing to figure out if you want to use code for a piece. So I didn't actively start doing that until grad school, but I wasn't, I wasn't afraid of it. It just, uh, I think that already was really helpful that I grew up with that technical background. That's yeah, that's really cool. Going back to your uh, your introduction to some to twentieth century music, mm-hmm. um, do you remember what were some of the things that first caught your ear? Because a lot of times, uh, the people I know that had that were really on that track to become a concert pianist or concert violinist or whatever, it sort of took a specific either a specific composer or a specific performance or something that sort of cracked the code for them and allowed them to go past, you know, traditional repertoire into Mm -hmm. more, more advanced music. Do you remember what that was for you? Oh yeah. I have some touchstone pieces. Well, I was in, well, gosh, I, you know, I loved my high school. It was Princeton public high school. And I just, there was a crowd of fabulous uh, music students, but also the music teachers were really committed to some new music exposure. So in choir, I sang the Durafle Requiem and the Benjamin Britten Ceremony of Carols. And I was uh-huh. like, oh, what? I just, I remember crying while we were singing. And I was like, what is happening? This is amazing. And that had never happened to me. I'd sung in choirs before, but there was something about, I don't know, 20th century rap that really got me. And then in orchestra, my orchestra teacher was, he was encouraging of a couple, fo- I wasn't there yet, but a couple folks who were in orchestra went, oh, can I write something or can I arrange something? And I just got so excited by like, oh my gosh, my friend Ben Locke arranged a, a Bartok microcosmos for orchestra. This is the coolest thing ever. And I was an oboist in the orchestra and just learning Ben's part and talking to Ben about what he wanted. I was, I don't know. It changed it from being music is something you perform that, that the people have all died, but I'm performing it <laughs> and decoding it to like, oh, this is living conversations with my adorable friend, Ben. Right. So I, uh, that was really formative. And then this guy, Randy Bauer, in our theory class, he he put in so much extra time. So he, on Fridays after school for a couple hours, it was just listening day. So I remember this gorgeous Friday, we just listened to all of piano phase. And I'd never, I'd never heard of phase. I'd never done any kind of non-standard rhythmic stuff. And I don't know, it blew me away. 
and different trains. And I got really on a Reich kick, like all the Reich repertoire. Basically from that day, we listened to piano phase and different trains in one day and little Lainey's head exploded. Um, <laughs> and I went, the record store in Princeton, Princeton Record Exchange is so great. And I, I made a lot of money as a math tutor at that time okay. in high school. And I spent all of it at the Princeton Record <laughs> Exchange. So that's how I got exposed to Bang on a Can because they had recorded some Reich. And that's how I got, um, God, that led me to like one thing led me to another. And I got all the different, I, that led me to Ethel. And then that led me like that, that thread of being so excited by those pieces and having the, the just the access to a record store and some money. Right. Um, I just went down the the rabbit hole and even talk about family support. Like my mom was a, a classical violinist. Like she, you know, Bartok was her weird and wacky 20th century touchstone, but mm-hmm. that was kind of it. So as I'd bring home the CD, she definitely, her face smushed. It's like, what are you, what is this? What are you <laughs> listening to? But she was so excited that I was excited. So I even just got feedback from parents that like, I'm happy for you to do this weird thing that we don't know about. And that's, you know, that gave me license to do it. Yeah. So how did, and then how did you kind of track your way through, uh, through academics, through school? Uh, because again, sometimes there's a desire when you're, uh, when you're going through the education process of really being slotted into kind of a singular thing. Mm-hmm. And um, I would say, again, you are anything but singular. So <laughs> how did, how were you able to, uh, how were you able to traverse that? Not consciously or actively. I think, um, well, undergrad, I was really pretty squarely in the, I write notes on staves for people okay. to play. Like I, I had done a couple things with electronics, but um, there was such an active community when I was, I went to Yale and I graduated 2004 and you can just look, there's so many composers I'm super excited about really active now who were undergrads over the course of my time there. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I, there was no, I didn't need to go outside that bucket of activity of just, I'm writing for, I wrote a half hour solo cello piece. I wrote a 20 minute piece for six classical guitars. I wrote a, a ton of solo piano music for the amazing pianists who were there. Like there was just so much energy that that was, pretty much all of the musical activity I did. Right. And then, uh, but then I moved to New York right after undergrad. And again, 2004 in New York, there was so much, I was really inspired by all the the different kinds of music that people my age and a little older were making that almost all the concerts I went to were like either buddies or people who were just a little older than me, you know, buddies of buddies. And I was like, ah, oh, getting tons of exposure to, Different things. And then really, I got to say, and then I went to Princeton for grad school. And that place, there's just a magic freaking halo around that place. <laughs> so they, you know, Dan Truman is one of my favorite just humans in the world. But also as a teacher, he was so welcoming. And I, as I say, like, I, I wasn't scared of technology or coding, but I'd never used that part of my brain for music before. And he was like, no, look at you. Like, you should totally just make some pieces for laptop orchestra and get involved. And, and you know, I have had just in my my math education life, my technical life, like there can be an atmosphere of like, you must be worthy with your intellect and dedication and devotion to the program and you must prove yourself. There was none of that crap with him. He was just so open and welcoming and he'd help anybody with a question. And I think that that community spirit really is the thing that got me to do. It wasn't even the sounds themselves or the music itself. It was that sense of community. And then my advisor was Paul Lansky, who was so Mm -hmm. like, all of, he 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 would just say he did electronic music because of the community. He talked about in one of our lessons where I brought him the score to a piece that had just been performed, and I was like expressing that I was a little upset. Like oh, I worked on this piece so long, and after the concert, everyone was like, "Cool, cool, thanks." Yep. He's like, "Yeah, that's why I got into electronic music because he just found the community was so much more conversational, like in the working process, conversational, and after concerts, just talking endlessly about what they'd heard and." Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, oh, yeah, I want that. That's really cool. So that's really what made me start writing music that needed, um, you know, computers, coding, yeah, hardware, whatever. Sure. But what's interesting to me is that unlike a lot of people who come to embrace technology, you did not pursue it as a way to create pieces that, you know, that I 
I don't know how to say it better uh, other than to say, you know, that you could hide in your study and make music and then like squirt it out on the internet and not have to interface with the rest of the world. This community aspect of it appears when I look at your work, it has always been with bands, with other performers, with things like, like side band with, with all of, you know, with, with different groups that were either formed to do a performance specific or maybe working with an existing group. You, you seem to have put yourself or or sort of like made a lot of your work as part of being either in a already existing community or to even develop a community. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I like, I like people or I like these people, the electronic <laughs> people I've worked with. Um, that's so much of the joy of it for me. I mean, how big, I'm, you know, you probably reach much wider audiences than I do, but you know, how many people are really going to hear my, uh, laptop ensemble piece like you know some people and that's fantastic but I'm in it for the people I'm making it for and with sure. like that's uh you know I don't have visions of like oh the the tens of thousands of listeners of the yeah, that, you know, <laughs> that's you know not really not realistic and not even really my desire at this point I just love the you know Seth and Yasha and Anne and the people I'm making it with are just delightful. I don't know. So it's the same way when I was a pianist, you know, I was going to be, I had this idea that I'd be a solo pianist, but then looking back on it, the, the memories I have that are most joyful are when I did chamber music, like when right. we did a trio, I did a whatever. And I just, that kind of, the conversations about musical interactions. I love eye contact. These days, even when I'm writing for another group, I will often say things in a score, like be sure to make eye contact here, or right. like all of you breathe at this bar, at this beat to get like those kinds of interactions performer interactions are some of the stuff I'm most excited about as a listener, not just a composer. So I I guess yeah. a lot of my work has had that kind of people to people. Well, it's funny you say that because yeah. the piece that I saw you do at the library, one of the things that was really cool about watching you perform was the way that you and Yash were looking at each other <laughs> and, and like very much keying off, you know, cause the game track is a thing that to a certain extent, you kind of look like you're doing, uh, kind of like lame jumping jacks, right? <laughs> using it, right? But, uh, it was really amazing to watch the interplay between the two of you while you were working, working the device. And, and then as, you know, as I viewed other work and stuff, it, it does seem like that kind of, interpersonal connection is a real hallmark of of how you how you make your stuff breathe it's really cool well first i the caveat for that piece i mean i married yasha narvison so when we play that mm-hmm. piece uh there's a real i say judge i don't really know how to there's an energy to that because i i do feel like you know there's being good friends with a performer and then there's being partner with right. them. The, and he wrote that piece. That's in line that he wrote. Okay. And that's one of my favorite things in the world to perform because it's oh, um, beautiful. It's such beautiful sounds. It's a beautiful piece of music, but also as a performer, it's, it's, he wrote it as kind of a game. So there's a constraints of the game and oh, you have okay. to do certain things to, to make the sounds happen. But, but it's a game that you have to win together. Like you have to sort uh-huh. of, um, get to certain musical spots and moments together. And a lot of that involves really fun interpersonal, you know, really weird face, like, oh, you're not going to say on stage, oh, you're almost there, but you can make a sort of squidgy face and make eye contact. (laughs) Like, oh, wait, oh, no, don't wait, you're almost there. And uh, making gorgeous music with a, you know, with a spouse is kind of the best for me. But, um, but yeah, but, but as you say, like, I think all of the pieces I make with other people, it's that, that goal as a listener or as a, as an audience member of seeing the connections between the players, I'm writing to facilitate that happening the clearest and the most satisfyingly for the players, Mm -hmm. but I want to facilitate it for the audience so they can get that same, like, Oh my God, even the solo pieces that I'm writing now, I'm Mm -hmm. doing a series of solo pieces called portrait pieces and, and friends who commission them. I'll interview them and I'll get a ton of recording of them talking about themselves or their playing or, just talking and a friend of mine, I just wrote for James Moore and it was, our friendship is so based around Scrabble. I, I recorded us playing Scrabble and I used a rec- the sound recording of the Scrabble game as a backing track, but hearing the person's voice and watching the live, uh, you know, guitarist or pianist or double bassist, like, like react to their voice and play. It's almost like 
chamber music again. Like it's almost like a double self that you're hearing and the audience gets to watch that interaction. And I, I just think it makes people better. It makes me a better listener, that kind of um, communication being evident on stage. That's, that's really interesting. Some of the nuggets you dropped are really interesting to me, especially this idea that you uh, kind of were in New York in that mid in the mid 2000s time frame, which was there was a lot of crazy stuff happening there. Mm -hmm. Uh, New music was really getting its legs in a very particular way and getting, getting the attention, you know, instead of just being underground or hidden away in lofts somewhere or something, it it Mm -hmm. was, it was definitely coming above ground in, in some pretty particular ways. What influences from, your peers and sort of the gestalt of the place. Mm-hmm. How much? How much of that was influential into uh, kind of maturing you as a composer? Oh, incalculable! It's no like that. That peer, ah, everything. I mean, everything. Every concert that I went to, I think. I mean, still every concert I go to, it's in the hopefully best possible way. I'm filing it into like, oh, how can I use this? How can I use this? Like, that, what a cool idea! How do I put this? How do I get juice out of this idea for my own stuff? So, I mean, Bang and McCann loomed really large. I did that summer program, the Bang and McCann summer program, I think okay. the second year it opened. So that was 2003, 2003 I think. And that, uh, a bunch of people, I mean, Bang and McCann is in New York, but also a bunch of people who did that program with me were in New York. And there was a magic where each of them was, I felt in a slightly different pocket of the new music scene, as you say, which exploded so large um, in those early off. So it was really fun hearing a lot of the kids coming out of Columbia, like all those Columbia composer concerts were really big. And I liked them. I liked actually that a lot of those concerts were music that didn't sound anything like I was writing, but I was really excited to talk to them about how they were thinking. I don't, I I feel like the, the kind of being exposed to stuff that, I wasn't interested in writing, but that affected my brain for how I wanted to write my own things. I think that that's actually really a powerful statement because I, I think a lot of times there's there's too much of a sense that we, you know, we listen to something and we would be directly influenced by it. And I think that maybe, especially in a situation like the early to mid aughts in, in New York, when there was so much stuff happening, you wouldn't have to be directly influenced by everything what you could be is you could be inspired to do things by watching other people who would become inspired doing things and so having so much stuff happening around you is going to give you agency to do the thing that you want to do exactly exactly and just talking to different people how their brains worked making music it wasn't even, I mean, this sounds more gorgeous that I was hearing, but it was even just, yeah, as you said, like being inspired by the people who were inspired, just the right. people who were getting energy out of all different kinds of working methods and sounds and ensembles. And um, I think that just really got me going. And to be honest, the community, like the community feeling at that time, you know, I was pretty new to the, I was brand new to the scene when I came, but already it was, I don't know, I... I'm in a privileged spot because I went to Yale, so a lot of the people, um, you know, playing a lot of these concerts had some kind of vague, I, I'd somehow met them through the Yale, you know, Connection. the Yale funnel into New York. Yeah, so I already, God, that's a huge leg up, and it might have been really different if I'd gone to a faraway school, but given that, I did quickly feel like, oh, this is such a great world, this is such a great bunch of people. And that, as you say, that gave me a ton of musical goals. Like, I, I, I could have been making music alone. For my and actually, it's funny you say that. These days, I am like, darn it, I need a solo practice. Like, these songs came out of like, <laughs> oh, not everything I do should be at right. the, the mercy of seven other schedules. Like, I need something that I can be excited about and work on just for me. So now I am developing that. But even just the idea that, oh, I want my work to really be tied to other people and tied to the community. I think through my undergrad in that time, it's just watching and being inspired by those people that made me feel that way. So one other thing I'm curious about, though, that you said is you mentioned that uh, a lot of people that, you know, went to school at the time that you did are now 
becoming fairly well known and, and becoming sort of popular within the world and getting their work done and stuff. That that kind of time period, like twelve to eighteen years, that seems to be sort of like a consistent development time for composers, right? What do you think mm-hmm. it is about that length of time that is important to a composer to sort of get their hit their stride? Or do you think it's more like it takes that amount of time for the public to find out a pers- about a person and accept them? I do I do strongly suspect that the reason we hear about a lot of composers, you know, yeah, something like a bit before twenty years after they're out mm-hmm. of school. Like I the resources and the and the the connections and the establishment, the attention being pointed on them, press being pointed on them, anything, um, that takes a in general, if you don't have really good PR resources or really strong connections coming into the scene, it can just take a long time to get people to, uh, you know, care about your work, to look mm-hmm. at your work in a serious way. That's, I guess, a related but separate question from composers hitting some kind of stride or having a more uh, sure. clarity in the voice. Yeah. I do feel, well, you know, hopefully forever I'll just be getting happier and happier with the work that I make. I am happier with the work that I make now, but um, but I think I just keep, shake. I kind of, I sort of joke with myself that every sort of five, seven years, I have radical new goals in just the <laughs> the the sort of surface level what I want to do. Like, you know, for all of undergrad and a bit after, it's like dots on lines, uh, that kind of thing. And then all of a sudden for a while, it was like, ooh, just very game-oriented speech rhythm-y, like um, Meredith Monk inspired, like, oh, that for a while. And then I got really into, you know, technology and, and code pieces and whatever. Like, ah, I just want to do that for a while. And I'm just coming on that, like, Ooh, I'm getting at the end of that period. I wonder what's coming next. Right. So I don't know what's coming next, but I, I, I wonder if it's just trying on a bunch of hats. Like if, if you've just, if you've, you might be making brilliant music, but if you're, you know, 22, you've probably not had time to try on a lot of different music making mm-hmm. personas. And maybe I'm making this up, but maybe something like 18, 20 years out of school, You've had the opportunity and exposure to try on a bunch of different things so you can borrow from each pot what you want. And then you can really start seeing unique combinations in people's practices because they've been exposed to so much and felt comfortable trying things. Yeah, I was going to say, you know which hat seems to fit best then too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But but I'm figuring it out. I don't know. I, I think the... Well, I will say I've been I've been extraordinarily lucky in the collaborators that I've had, and a lot of it I think is to do with the schools that I've been to and the resources they've had. But, but I I'm still I don't think I've especially figured it out in a fine of like ah oh, Lainey's voice is there it is and it's developed and I don't I don't know I'm every new piece I'm kind of I have my little toolbox, but I'm willing to dump all of it if there's some idea I get or some new inspiration that I have. Like when I um. When I heard Tune Yards, Meryl Garbus for the first time, I don't know uh, how many years ago is that? Maybe five, hmm, more than six years ago now. Um, I, it was kind of a this changes everything moment. I was like, oh, you're amazing. This is music unlike what I have been concentrating on before. Like this is what, this is really what I want to do. And that's largely responsible for a lot of the choices. Like my voice and electronic stuff, even if you can't hear it, like that is my North Star is just listening to those Tune Yards albums or... I'm trying to think of other moments like that. Or yeah, I don't know when I got to Princeton and Plork was so amazing. Like I'm willing to kind of trash anything if I'm excited by a new thing. So even saying that I've hit a stride, I'd be nervous to say it. Cause I, right. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what. You don't, don't want to jinx it. <laughs> I don't want to jinx it maybe. Or I don't, um, or I, I, I'm unwilling to tie my future self to anything that I'm doing right now. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows what I'll be wanting to do. Um, and I'm lucky that I have, you know, like a teaching gig and a salary and whatever that I don't mm. need to worry about feeding myself. If all of a sudden I'm like, just kidding. I want to make like kinetic sculpture sound art. Like, I, brr, I don't know. Maybe that'll happen. I don't know. Right. Um, well, yeah. I'm, I, I am kind of curious about the process you go through in, in terms of composition, because you know, that it's, it's gotta be kind of multi-layered. I mean, do you start with the people you want to work with do you start with an idea is it like is it not something that's easily codified in that way because uh, again i uh 
you know, in doing a little bit of digging on you, I mean, in some cases you say, hey, you, uh, I like uh, I like speaking about and doing things that are related to uh, to my Jewish heritage, for example, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, but then, you know, I'll, I'll see other stuff. It's like I was really inspired by this person I was working with and mm-hmm. I decided to go down this route. Or there are other pieces that look like maybe, you know, I have always been, you know, I my assumption is you had always been curious about what it would sound like to get six kazoos bug- yeah. buzzing. <laughs> and yep. uh, the only way you're going to find out is if you write a piece for it and make it happen, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I'm curious about the, the process you go through to actually come up with the composition because it sounds like there there's a whole lot of conceptual or a whole lot of thought that goes in it before you start scratching out you know dots on paper or mm-hmm. dots on a computer screen mm-hmm. oh my gosh almost all the work I do on a piece is before I actually sit down and make the piece like there's so much I take a walk and stare into space and I wake up thinking about it and I'm like taking a shower thinking like that's just just um this is so disgusting but the analogy that I give students because students talk to me all the time about like I don't you know white page syndrome. Like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to make. And I was like, you know, you eat the world, like you eat the inspiration of the world around you. And then it's like, it's like your digestive tract. It's like, you know, (laughs) this is so gross. I'm sorry to do this to your podcast, but I say it's like pooping, you know, before (laughs) you poop, so much processing has to go on with all the influences and all the ideas and all the everything. It just goes through your guts and it gets broken down and changed and you take what you need from this and what you do for that, whatever. And then in the end, like, ga-ga, it happens really, for me, this is my process. I just like, bah, you poop and there it is. So if you were living with me, you would see that like weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, I'm thinking, 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 and I'm talking with, you know, yeah, most of my work at this point is commissioned by somebody, a particular person, ensemble, whatever. Okay. So I'm like, oh, cool. I have to make a piece for Jack Quartet. That's amazing. Uh, and then I just like, I stare at it like, oh, what do I, okay. What's, what am I interested in now? Not musically. Oh, okay. Can I, is there something I can bring? In? Okay. Or I, oh, I heard that concert with that sound and I'm so into that sound. Is there a way I can bring that in? And I'm just kind of staring into space and thinking for so long. And then I really need that, like, uh, depending on the length or the depth, like, several days of nothing else. Like I don't really, it's terrible. Hygiene goes to the wind. Like I don't really eat (laughs) just like I, I am. And it's usually laptop at this point. It's just me and a laptop and that is it. Um, And that's my process. And that is distinct. I remember so many teachers telling me about a good, healthy process was like every day you carve out a few hours and that's how you make it. But I just, you know, that I've, the couple times I've had the luxury of being able to have that schedule, it's been awesome. But just the way my life works, I don't, I don't, I guess I could do it, but I've never managed to get myself to do it with, as you say, all the other things that I do, having mm-hmm. that like two to three hours a day kind of process. I haven't trained myself to do it. So I've trained myself for this other model of every new piece is like a puzzle of what do I want to do and how am I going to do it? And most of that is away from the actual putting notes on lines or putting code in a laptop or putting whatever um, effect really affects an adult. Most of what I do, it's Reaper. Well, Reaper and Max are my two little buddies. Like Reaper Mm -hmm. and Max are, I'd say more than even score paper at this point where I get my ideas. But before I even open the applications, open the environments, like I, I'm just thinking I'm not a tool. I'm not inspired by tools. You know what I mean? I'm inspired by here's the thing that I want to do. And then how do I wrangle the tools to make it work? And, uh, and that's kind of the process at this point. I just get an idea and then dr- dig down into how I can make it happen. So you say that you you don't get inspiration from tools, but I'm wondering, do you, do you ever take advantage of them to sort of like either stimulate development or, I don't know, get you out of ruts? Like, do you do yeah, anything yeah. with like generative type uh, processes or do you do anything with, like um, I don't know. There's a lot of there's a lot of different tools like, that you can make things that you can make or you can find that are max driven that are sort of like, you know, here's an outline and let's see what a system might be able to fill the outline right. with. Right? right. Do you do any of that kind of stuff? Or are you or are you more specific mm-hmm. and and like hand like hand driven on that? 
I mean, the fact that I'm like, ooh, let me think of a story where yeah. that happened to me, and I kind of can't think of one. That's, that's maybe telling tale, I, right? <laughs> it's telling a tale, but but I will say, like, of course that ha- I'm sure that has happened. There's nothing coming to mind, but you know, I got a patch open and I drag you know drag in something by accident. I'm like, oh, wait a minute, that's kind of like, oh, wait, oh, that's neat. Of course, I'm sure that has happened to me. I don't have like a purity of vision right, where like right. any new ideas. No, absolutely. Or in Reaper, like. Uh, I get some new plug-in for some reason, but then it has some other feature. I'm like, wow, that what? I got to use that for something. <laughs> that absolutely happens, but I just, I'd say like most, most, most of the compositional work is not, I know people who their, their fluency in a, you know, in a DAW or in a coding environment is such that they really just kind of dance around in mm-hmm. the environment and yeah. that makes beautiful work. Whereas for me, it's mm. really not that. It's um, also my memory is terrible. So any fluency in any system that's why I love math. I always forgot everything and had to recreate it oh, nice. all from it. Cause I don't remember. <laughs> I have a horrible memory. So even just in code or whatever, I never, no matter how many hours I code something, if I'm away from the environment for, I don't know, three weeks, bleh, I will have to remember. I, I write myself little comments everywhere. Like Lainey, remember how you did this? Right. It's this to this, to this, to this setting. Um, so I just, I think maybe it's a fluency question that like, I don't, I don't have the fluency that would, let me be inspired by tools that way. But, uh, but also I think the way my brain works, I have such a, like this piece is about me and basically any piece you can point to that I've made, I can give you some kind of a little three bullet point list of right. here are the things, the pieces. And then I just figure out how to, how to realize that somehow. And sometimes it's really concrete like this. I literally have a piece for orchestra that is only pitches E and D and that's it. And that's the whole idea of the piece. It's like how rich and fun and exciting can I make a, an orchestra piece with two pitches, which PS will never get played again because so shockingly, no orchestra wants a piece <laughs> that is very comp- rhythmically complex with only pitches E and D. Yeah. If anyone's listening and is anyone's pumped by that, <laughs> give me a call. But I'm pretty much assuming that piece will never again see the light of day. But anyway, like I get those kinds of ideas either concrete like that or um, yeah, or just this piece that I'm working on now for for a laptop ensemble, for a Paula Matheson's laptop ensemble. It's really, I just had the idea. Like I started thinking about this piece for sideband for shortly after the 2016 election. And there was just a lot of anxiety and trauma floating right. around all my friends and community. And I was, my idea for the piece was how do I ease that kind of existential angst? Like how can this piece in a direct way somehow contribute to making people feel better? I thought of it as a sonic equivalent of like, could I just give everyone sort of like a blanket and a hot cup of something? Right. Like what can yeah. what can make everyone feel better with their anxieties. So I don't know if my piece will actually do that, but but that meant that all the decisions that I was making were were inspired by that and not inspired by like, oh, I heard this new networking tool makes the latency that much quicker. Like I, <laughs> you know, that's super useful to me. Yeah. Um, and actually, as I say that, there are, you know, but new network tools that I'm super excited. Right, that's but it amazing. doesn't necessarily but that doesn't inspire. inspire. You, right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. One one question I have, because you've kind of you've kind of dropped some hints about it but it sounds to me like some of your compositions to to actually get to the point where you're satisfied can take an extraordinary long amount of time yeah (laughs) yeah yeah that's an issue that's an issue i don't if you look i don't make a ton of music like i make enough music to keep me happy but um it takes forever and i'm really jealous of composers who are we can I keep using the word fluency. Yeah. We're just, we're just like, yeah. oh, I have an idea. Ba 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 boom. Here's my piece, and I've just never. God, that's never happened to me. What, uh, what are the things that draw the process out for you? Is it, is it one of like doing something and then refining it, refining it, or is it doing something and convincing yourself that it's good enough to call done, or is it? That when then when you start doing something, it generally inspires you to do the next thing, and you end up like throwing away the first seven versions because you got inspired to do the right. next. I hear, there's a lot of ways that 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 right. that process can get extended. I'm wondering what it is that you find for yourself. It's a good question. I mean, actually, I think in my analogy, I think the digestion stage is the thing that just takes me forever. The time the time before I'm actually concretely making Mm. any elements but when I'm just in my head going like oh wait how what's the idea I'm really comfortable basing this whole piece on even if it's a two-minute piece like just what's the idea what's the driving conceit of the whole piece that Mm. takes me forever I mean 
I guess once or twice I can think of times where just I got an idea quickly and I did it and ta-da, it's done. But almost always it takes forever for me to feel comfortable. Like, oh, this is an idea that'll be interesting. This is an idea. Because I don't generally switch course, switch directions. Like once I have an idea for a piece okay. and I sit down and I really start doing nuts and bolts, I'll definitely revise like, oh, that should be a G and not a G sharp. Like that'll, that but should be But you're not going to change total I'm not, direction. Exactly. Right. Like the, the conceit of the piece really stays once I start working on it. So I have to be really committed to it. It's funny when you say it's conceptual music that I have a whole host of associations with that, that I don't think you, people would hear in my stuff, but I guess it is conceptual in that every decision I make is driven by some initial concept. So yeah, even if I change things later on, it's still in service of that initial concept. So actually what my favorite, I think my favorite lighthearted bit of composing is after I've gotten some kind of, I call it left to right, just sort of a time interval based draft done. Then I get to go like, oh, ba -ba -da -ba, I'm going to switch this thing and like, oh, I'll change this thing. That's very lighthearted and quick for me. But yeah, I guess it's that, I don't know, pre-compose or I don't know what you want to call it. It's the digestion part that right. just takes me forever. Yeah. I got a piece due, you know, in like uh, three weeks and I'm still <laughs> digesting and I'm like, uh, better digest faster. Right. So I'm, yeah, I don't know how to speed it up. Maybe in 10 years I'll know how to speed it up, but Maybe. not yet. Yeah. Well, Lainey, unfortunately, our time is just about up. But before I let you go, I uh, could you tell us a little bit about what you have coming up, like around the corner, either composition work that's about to be be played, or maybe performances that you yourself are going to do, so that people who might be uh, might be available would would get a chance to see you work. Well, I've got um, a bunch of performances of White Fire, my solo um, voice and electronics. Um, set coming up. The first one is at um, the Splice Festival in Oxford, Ohio. So if you're around Oxford, Ohio, come drop on by. I think that's, uh, and it's end of February and it'll be on my website very soon. And then end, end of February, I'll be in Oklahoma City doing White Fire um, at University of Oklahoma. Uh, and I'm giving a talk there about how Oh, my Judaism just kind of, we didn't talk about it, but but it's true. My Jewish identity filters in in various ways to a lot of the work I do. So I'm going to be talking with the Women's Studies and Judaic Studies program there about how that works out. And then I have these laptop, uh, these amazing laptop ensembles at Stony Brook and Wesleyan who are doing this new piece of mine called Overshare, which uses um, kind of real-time voting with live uh, generated signal and lots of sort of on stage therapy of the airing of anxieties. It's a it's a really intense piece. I'm asking the members of the ensemble to say out loud just single sentences of of their own anxieties and concerns, and then to also collect um, the anxieties and concerns of people in the audience. And then that text will be vocoded on top of you know a signal of of them recording their voices singing a drone on stage. So it's all acoustic, but it's um really, really informed by the vocoder music that I've loved for a long time. So that's happening. I think it's happening. Oh God, I'm sorry. I'm horrible with dates. I think the the Wesleyan one, I think is end of February and the Stony Brook one is middle of April. Okay. I think that's true. But my website, you know, when I update it <clears throat> this weekend, I'll be up <laughs> on my website and, uh, and yeah, people can, people can check it out. Okay. Yeah. And that'll be LaneyFefferman.com, correct? Perfect. All right, great. Um, well, I will have uh, links in the show notes for people who want to check it out. Lenny, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to have this chat. It was really great. It's fun to kind of, uh, I mean, I will be thinking about my digestive system for the rest of the day. <laughs> but uh, beyond that, it, it was really interesting to think about sort of like uh, thinking through that. Because a lot of times, uh, you know, a, a lot of times I, I tend to find myself certainly uh, thinking really in improvisational terms and and kind of flipping that script and saying, no, you know, work, spend the time digesting the, and, and coming up with a conceit that's going to be fulfilling enough to really drive you through the whole process. That's really inspiring to me, and I, I appreciate you sharing. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks for talking to me. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to let you go. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. All right. Bye. Bye. Many thanks to Lainey Pfefferman for having the great chat. It was really interesting to hear her process, how she digests her uh, influences to make her music. I think that that's such a great metaphor. 
Um, I hope that you will take the opportunity to go to, over to LaneyFefferman.com to check out her work. And uh, just look around the internet. She's got a lot of stuff out there. It's really interesting work and worth you checking out. In the meantime, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, drop me a line, ddg at cycling74.com or darwin.gross at gmail.com. And um, I especially want to thank those newest subscribers to the patreon.com website. It's patreon.com slash darwingross. Um, I want to thank you for joining on and for helping keep the lights on over here at the podcast. With that, we will head out for the week. We'll catch you next time around. Bye.